Welcome to the Conservation Is podcast, a Conservation Chat UK production. This is the place where we start the conversation about all things conservation and share them with our listeners. You can join in and interact with us using the hashtag Conservation Is and the hashtag Conservation Chat UK. Let's start the conversation. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Conservation Is podcast. I'm Laura and I'm Stu and we're going to be talking to you today about um, one of our travel experiences. Well, not one of our travel experiences, one of Stu's travel experiences. So um, was it 2015? Yes, five five years ago now. Yeah, in 2015, Stu went on an epic trip to Madagascar, which everybody knows is a major biodiversity hotspot. So um, I've whipped together some questions that I'm going to ask Stu and we're going to just delve in back in time and uh, learn about his trip in Madagascar. So first of all, I want to ask you, how did you get there? So we walked, it took us about four months. (laughs) No, so we uh, flown in, but we've flown in via Kenya. So we uh, had transit in Nairobi, which was quite scary at first because once we got there, for some reason, we stayed in a really uh, old part of the airport which seems quite run down and so on. And, and we thought that was the extent of the airport because we were quite ignorant and we'd never been before. But actually on the way back, just around the corner from where we were sat, is like a really modern terminal with all the facilities oh, and really? so on. Uh, so yeah, and, th- and then from uh, Nairobi, we had about a three hour flight to Madagascar and we flew into the capital of Madagascar. It's quite disheartening actually flying into Madagascar because we were going over what used to be forest and it sort of looks like our moorland now where the trees have obviously lost. The landing in the capital, the runway was a bit bit scary. You, you could feel everything when you landed and it looks a bit like a dirt track. And then once we got in the airport, we had temperature checks because we'd come from Kenya. So they were checking for yellow fever and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but the flight was quite comfortable, actually. It's quite quite nice to get yes. there. It's about eight hours to Kenya, three hours to Madagascar. Yeah. Um, so what about the internal travel? How did you get from A to B while you were in Mad- Madagascar? So we went for an arranged tour. So the, we had one night in the capital and then we had the, about a 13-hour drive the next day up to the northwest where we stayed. Uh, we stayed in a dry forest up there. But to get there sort of mixed transport the first part was really good because it was an organized tour we were in a nice mini bus with um seat belts and so on and um the infrastructure is fine over there nice roads and so on for the most part but there were some sort of sketchy bridges along the way there was one bridge we had to meet a deadline because it was only open for a couple of hours a day because they were um doing repair work on it and there was another bridge I remember, which was like, it's almost made out of metal on the bottom, like sheet metal type thing. But like roofing? Stronger than roofing, but yeah, it looked a bit like roofing. You could get a truck over it, so, you know, I weren't worried about it falling. But there was holes in it. But the worrying thing is, there was a massive picture, like a billboard at the start of the bridge, showing like a truck half hanging over the bridge with some safety warning God. about how to, how to access the, or get over this bridge. But uh, we had skilled drivers, so it was fine. The second part of the travel didn't go too well. So what we did, we drove up to the northwest to a lovely uh, beach resort called Majunga, I think it's pronounced. And that's like really, really tropical. It's beautiful. It's on the Indian Ocean. We stayed in quite a luxury hotel there. And then what we did, we almost jumped on. I think there's a picture, so I'll try and embed it. But we jumped on what only can be described as like an open back army wagon. So we were sat either side at the back in this open cabin and it was sort of fun when you were on the road. But as soon as we started going off road to get into the forest, it got really, really bumpy. I uh, ended up taking a strap off my rucksack and tying it to the ceiling. So I had something (laughs) to hold on to. And um, at one point the van broke down, so they had to fix it. But just coming into our camp, so after being on this van for about five hours, We actually had a bit of a near-death experience where the brakes failed. So we were going down a dirt track. I don't know how fast we were going, but it seemed about 40 miles per hour. You know, it was probably much slower, but 
when you're in these situations, you fear for the worst. And we were going for what seems eternity down a one-way track. And we start going almost up the sides. And uh, because the brakes had failed, it got really worse. I was looking at the driver and he took the keys out to try and restart it. So at one point, the engine weren't even running. So we were just going down with gravity. And I swear to God, there was a point when I was thinking, I need to jump out of this van. And I was like <laughs> looking out the back of like, how can I jump out? But then he did something with the key and put it in and it worked. It's obviously not the first time it's happened. Yeah. Well, that was worrying when we got to camp. They said, oh, this has happened before. But it, it was like really, really dodgy. Okay, so you're in Madagascar and you've arrived and you're kind of settling in. So what? tell me about the people. What are the people like? Well, it's just an, it's just an amazing country, like really amazing people. So it's just like one of them countries I've always wanted to go. And like, How come? Why did you always want to go there? Just because of the biodiversity, really. It's sort of, there's lots of human impact on it now, but it's still sort of an untouched mecca for a lot of animals. So about 90% of their flora and fauna is endemic there. And I'm really into reptiles as well, so I know it's really, really good for reptiles. But the people themselves, they, they couldn't do any more for us, really. We had this uh, great guide, and he brought his son with us. And it's sort of weird, because we were going over there, and uh, Madagascar, I don't know if you know, but they live under the poverty line, so under $2 a day, as described by the United Nations. But obviously there's areas of wealth as well. So when we got there, our guide, his son, had like the latest clothes on and an ipad and so on and it's almost like a kid from my local area but once we started getting into the rural areas you could sort of see the poverty but the people were just so happy because they were sort of had a community spirit so we visited a school over there which was quite embarrassing because we took some gifts over for the kids uh, we took some pencils uh, maps and, and uh, little ball games and so on just as a gift and I suppose it's a typical Western thing where we just give a gift and that's it. But the kids in this school had like prepared like a dance for us and gave a really, really good performance. And then the teacher was like, oh, right. And what have you got? And it was like, oh, here's our gifts. But it was like quite embarrassing because it was that almost like Western thing, take our gifts, which they were really thankful for. But I sort of wish we did something to uh, replicate what they did for us. Because it was really like heartwarming uh, to see this these these kids do these dances for us, but you could sense a bit of tension between the people as well. Because I, d I don't know too much about the politics of it, and there has been military coups in um, Madagascar over the years, and they're still faced with stuff like the the plague and stuff like that. So stuff. Really. Yeah. So there was an outbreak just after we had gone a year or two after, sort of things we take for granted. Madagascar is quite unique in a sense because when the continent split it was like sort of wedged between what was Asia and wedged between what is Africa so it is an African country but there's a lot of Asian influence in there and roughly speaking uh, with the people in Madagascar there's like the highland people which uh, generally have Asian origin and the, around the coastal communities and forgive me if I'm getting this wrong I'm just going off what our guy told us when we were there the coastal communities have more African influence and apparently there's a bit of a tension between them two uh, cultures within the country. We didn't really witness any of it, it was just going off like stories we had been told by various guides and so on. Mm. And uh, one of the guides we had called, called Joe, he was from the city but he was working out in the bush with us. And he, he said about like there's even language differences between certain areas because uh, Malagasy is the main language but also there's a lot of French influence and Malagasy is very similar to the French language mm -hmm. which was great because we had a language lesson but we had it about two days before we come home so oh, wow. <laughs> yeah it's always nice to whenever I go to a new country I always like to at least learn how to say hello thank you yeah. goodbye well, we knew we knew basic stuff like that yeah always um, good but, I mean, our guides were back. It makes me think because the guides, I don't know what they were paid, but it is a poor country. But, like, they were so well trained. So when we do our Masters in the UK, it's like one or two years. Their Masters is seven years. 
Really? And they're all bilingual as well, so they can speak several languages. And I'm like, the skill set they have is like phenomenal. Yeah, amazing. Um, so what did you do while you were there? Uh, so what we did, we, we went with an organised tour and it was a conservation tour. So we were working on conservation projects. So lots of cool things we were doing in in the forest so we went to a dried forest which was adjacent to some wetlands so we were doing stuff like uh, bird netting uh, transit walks looking for lemurs uh, some people were doing mark capture and release with chameleon species net surveys for fish pitfall traps just to see what we can find as well and it was really cool because we saw lots and lots of uh, species there lots of lemur species which madagascar is obviously famous for but some of the groups with us and some of the scientists working with us that have actually discovered like new species of snakes. And uh, some of, I weren't there at the time, but some of our group had found like a tail off which had been shed by a lizard. And one of the scientists was saying they think it's actually a new genus of uh, lizard. So it was like really, really cool. And although the nature has been fragmented, it, it's still thick with it. So if I go walking around the UK I might see the odd songbird where there because there's still a lack of real habituation you could just see primates jumping out the tree at you or, the, or just lizards right mm. close to you and so on so it was like really really cool to see probably the most important thing to ask you on this podcast but also I think what our listeners will most want to know is what wildlife did you see in Madagascar so in addition to the ones I've just said uh, my favourite thing was probably the crocodiles so I, I've always been obsessed with crocodiles and in Madagascar you see Nile crocodiles or what they think are Nile crocodiles so they think these stayed on uh, the island of Madagascar when it split from the mainland of Africa but we were actually there with some scientists who were doing DNA testing of these crocodiles to see if actually they're a unique species so a lot of people went for the, the lemurs, but I was like really surprised by the bird life out there. So where we were, there's like a, a fish eagle which is critically endangered, but lots of bright coloured birds. And also one thing, and speaking to the field leaders and the guides and so on, one thing which was quite extraordinary is the amount of invertebrates. Mm. And they were saying that like there's not many entomologists in Madagascar. So like a lot of these species might be new species, which obviously the locals know, but they've not, they're new to science. Uh, and obviously the lemurs as well were great and the chameleons were great. Mm. So that might be a little bit of a ecologist and, and, and conservationist niche is to become an entomologist out in Madagascar. Yeah. Oh, the bats and everything, it's just yeah. it's too many to name. Amazing. Can you can you just divulge and tell us because I'm sure our listeners would love to hear about how you caught a crocodile? Yeah, so this was quite a scary but fun night, and it it was scary as well. I was actually with one of my students at the time, so obviously I'm thinking health and safety. I'm there in shorts and sandals as well, so I'm thinking not really got the PPE. Here. But it was sort of billed as a, we're going to go and catch some crocodiles to take the DNA. And like when you look in the guide and when you've seen pictures and so on, these crocodiles are probably about a metre long at the most. So we're thinking, oh yeah, that, that's great. They normally grab them, put them on the boat we're on, take a, a tissue sample so they can do DNA analysis, take some measurements and so on. So we would... Uh, one of the guys catching the crocodiles was a, sh a student who was doing his dissertation on crocodiles and he was really passionate about crocodiles. So he, he essentially had the job of trying to noose the crocodiles with what can be described as something like a, a dog pole, a dog grasp or a catch pole. So it involved a lot of time in the mangroves. So I'm there in my shorts and flip flops and we're whining in and out of mangroves. It's really hot, sweaty, there's mosquitoes biting us. At this point, I'm getting sort of travel sick as well because we're in and out, in and out on a small boat. It's pitch black as well, so there's no artificial light apart from our spotting light, which we're using to, to see the eye shadow of the crocodiles. And of course, when you see a crocodile, you don't really know how big it is until it's out of the water. So we're expecting these meter-long crocodiles. 
And the guy at the front of the boat grabs this crocodile and, and he's got it and it it's just goes crazy, really thrashing around in the water. And you could see instantly that this was a big crocodile. So uh, one of the other guys was like telling us all to get to the back of the boat because at first he was trying to contemplate putting it on the boat. And it was only when you pulled it upside, it was actually bigger than the boat. So it was like, <laughs> th this was not going well. And the captain of the boat, he, he was like really, really brave. He'd like helped tie up the mouth of the crocodile. So obviously this was really an important sample because it was such a big crocodile. Because crocodiles there, unfortunately, are persecuted because they do take some of the zebu, which is like a, a cattle breed, which the locals almost use as a currency. So it's a sign of wealth the more you have. So you can understand they want to protect them. So we've got this crocodile and then we have to drag it all the way back to the bank. Now I don't know how far this was, but to me it seemed like about a kilometre. For all I know it could have been about 10 metres because I was caught up in the moment, but it did seem like quite a journey. So we get it to the side and then we pull up the crocodile up the bank. So it takes a good army of people to do this because it is a huge animal. But I'm quite surprised how relaxed it are. And then a few of us had to jump on the crocodile. Which was like, by this time I'm buzzing by the way. Because I'm like, the scared part's gone. Now if someone said at the start of the night, oh you're going to catch this massive crocodile. I'd be like, not for me. But as soon as I was in the moment, I, I just sort of, you know, I've worked with lots of animals anyway. So I just went into go mode to get it done. And then we got this crocodile and it's quite placid and I just remember holding the legs up so it couldn't kick. One of the lead scientists was on the head and the mouth was taped by now so you've only really got to worry about the power. I say only, you know, the tail can break your legs or whatever. But we actually measured it and it was a 11 foot 2, which is quite, quite a big animal. Yeah. But apparently it's one of the biggest ones they've caught there as well. So it's like quite a unique moment and God, it was an experience of a lifetime. Yeah, sounds pretty epic. <laughs> I don't know if I've got the guts to jump on the back of a cro crocodile. Okay, so um, also I would also like to know about the accommodation you stayed in, because generally traveling, um, and especially in the like, if you're going to do a conservation project, like accommodation isn't necessarily like the top of the list, is it, of considerations? So, what was your accommodation like while you're out there? Well. Whilst we were in the forest, we were actually camping, so we, we did a couple of weeks in tents. Uh, that was quite rough because it, it was basic, but we knew it was going to be basic because, you know, you're sort of off grid. They have, a, they have a generator, they put on a few hours of the day, so there was a little bit of electricity. It was almost like the showers were buckets of water, so we had a little uh, makeshift shower unit we could go in. But it was almost like as soon as you wash, you were dusty again. Yeah. But it was really, really to be expected. But I was really surprised by the hotels uh, when we got from the airport, plus when we went to the resort in the northwest before we went in the forest. These were like really, really luxury hotels, I, I thought anyway. One of them, we had our own little blocks. So it was like almost holiday apartments on a lush beach. Uh, the other one, it was like sort of a compound. But again, really nice food there and, and really anything what you would expect in, in the modern world, to be honest. It was really surprising how nice it was. Yeah. And again, the people really made the experience was in it, the hotels. And I, so. I know that you're a camper and you like wild camping and you're not shy of, you know, getting a bit down and dirty and a bit wild. But was it a bit of a shock to you when you went from these lovely hotels and then suddenly you were camping in the sand? Yeah. Uh, not a shock as such, because when we were in these hotels, we sort of said to each other, oh, we need to get a good sleep now, because the chances are we might not have one. And uh, they were small tents as well, which uh, wasn't a problem as such. Some of the zips didn't work, so we were worried about mosquitoes and so on. But if you think these tents are like they were two-man tents, but on top of that you had your rucksacks and so on, so it was literally a place to sleep. Now there was a, a like a canteen area, like a shelter where they had chairs and tables mm. and stuff and so on. So it's not as if we had to cook in them and so forth. Not so much privacy though. No, it was literally a case of get your head down and mm. sleep in them. I expect you were so busy while you were out there, you didn't really have five minutes to relax. No, it was, it was right, really, really busy and, and quite full on. And um, 
one of the camps was quite funny actually because there was lots of uh, scorpions on the camp. Mm. Now they weren't deadly scorpions, but they could give you a heck of a bite. So at on an evening, people used to go with a UV light because you can see the scorpions uh, light up glow mm. with a UV light. I think we've got some pictures as well of that. Uh, so they used to put them in buckets and you used to have to wear your boots all the time to go to the toilet, which was a hole in the ground, essentially. But after a few nights, I was that knackered that I just found myself going barefoot to the toilet, just not thinking <laughs> about these uh, scorpions and stuff. And then there is a... You'd become habituated yeah, to your living circumstances. And there is a heck of tra a big tarantula in the toilet as well, mm. like in the ceiling. But like instead of everyone being scared, everyone was like, come then show us. Show us the tarantula. So it was like really cool like that. And there was like brown lemurs on one camp, some farkas on another camp and stuff like that. It weren't one of these sort of faking nature experiences. Mm. You were there and it was as, as real as it got. And these camps are only open for a few months of the year as well. So it was a, a real eye opener. How much money did you spend? Like how, how what was the cost of living like out there? Yeah, so as I said before, the, the most expensive thing was the flights, obviously. But as I said before, in the country, uh, people live in quite a lot of poverty. So in terms of uh, how much you spend, now if I was going as a tourist trip in the cities and so on, I'd probably spend more because I'd be buying food all the time where my food was included. But just to give you sort of an example, I could buy a bottle of local rum for about, the equivalent of two pounds UK money and this this was like a really really big bottle um, so I didn't spend a lot at all it was like really really cheap it's probably a bit more expensive on our camp because they had a captive audience but I just remembered like the price of a beer and so on was probably about 50p in the hotel. Yeah, it's always pretty shocking isn't it when you mm. leave the UK and pretty much go anywhere else and beer is so much cheaper one thing I will say though is uh, Madagascar has a closed currency so this is quite important if you are thinking about going uh, so some places do accept euros but what a closed currency means is you can't get your money changed before you go to the country so it's not like you can go to the local travel agents and order Madagascan currency mm. so when you're in the airport as soon as you you're leaving Madagascar and you go to the departure lounge you can't use Madagascar currency anymore so you've got to use your cards or euros. But when you get in the country, there's a, a currency exchange at the airport because we got there quite late. That was shut. But thankfully, because of our guide and local knowledge, they knew another place which could open just for us. So, um, I mean, I've probably changed about 100 quid in Madagascar currency and I'd spent nowhere near that. And again, everything was yeah. included. But also, I suppose, because you are out in the wild you don't really need money do you no no so it's more if you were if you're enjoying the kind of more um kind of holiday side of madagascar yeah. rather than a conservation yeah. type and excursion that, i think a lot of our money actually we give to our guide as a tip because he, he really deserved it and you know it just sort of was a reward for his hard work really yeah putting up with you for two weeks <laughs> yeah Definitely. Uh, what, one thing I didn't say before about the uh, people, and this is something that stuck with me, and uh, it's not just Madagascar, I've seen it in other places, South Africa's the other one. I can never get over how happy kids are to have a school and be in education. Mm. So I know, like, a lot of time over here, like, people hate schools and, oh, I've got to go back to school where I just see kids over there who are so happy to have a chance. And like, especially in some of the villages in the rural areas we went to where the communities really come together to build, build schools and so on. It's sort of one of my favourite moments just to see how engaged the kids were and how happy they were to have. So, um, this is my last question. What is your best memory from this trip? And was there, was there a defining moment for you when you were in Madagascar? Yeah, so one of my best memories is probably the, the crocodile story, which, which I said before. But my other one, I don't know if this is a, a positive memory or a negative memory. It was sort of, you know, you go to Madagascar wanting to see all this wildlife and you sort of say to yourself, oh, we need to protect it. Why are the people destroying the forest and so on? When, when you actually get there, you know, 
obviously there's the exception because there's some big companies there but when you get there you realize it's people just getting by a lot of the exploitation is uh, charcoal and use of timber and so on and that's just the cultural use of charcoal so even in the in the upmarket hotels the country cooks on charcoal uh, but you know there's not masses of amounts of jobs there people are still working off the land a lot of the food produced goes to local communities to feed local communities and so on so i sort of left with uh, an impression that it's going to be quite difficult to preserve madagascar mm. so i think you know investment is key to you know ecotourism for example is really key to the economy so I, I i just think it's one of them where you can't wave a magic wand and say stop doing what you're doing because they're not massively exploiting it for greed they're sort of trying to get by trying to get by yeah, yeah. and they're such amazing people you sort of sympathize and say what would i do in their situation yeah yeah it's quite sad isn't it because it is such an incredibly you know it's such a special place like there's nowhere else really like it in the world is there no um, I haven't been and I'd love to go so hopefully um, me and Stu will visit there one day together but um, unless there's anything else you you want to talk about I think that's everything I've got today yeah I'd just say obviously support uh, humanitarian and uh, conservation organizations working with local people on the ground in Madagascar and just look at ways you can help so like previously we've done some fundraising events for a charity called Seed Madagascar. Think about how you can help it. If you want to preserve this wildlife, you must, uh, or we must, I should say, do more to help the people in Madagascar because they yeah. are the key. I mean, isn't it? Like you think about all of these conservation issues, wildlife going extinct, etc., etc. And nine times out of ten, it's down to poverty. Yeah. Or like poaching or you know human wildlife conflict it's always down to poverty so if we feed the world we look after each other and you know we spread a bit of love and um stop pointing fingers mm. we'll probably get somewhere a, a lot quicker yeah. and I, I just uh, to finish obviously i've got limited experience there but the madagascar people would you know they're not asking for handouts they're so hard working and they're so industrious. So I just think they need some of the benefits that we sort of take for granted, like education and modern healthcare, healthcare and, and yeah. sanitation and so on. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Stu. Um, if you guys enjoyed this little travel adventure uh, podcast, please let us know because we've got loads more that we can be sharing with you. Um, please make sure to like the video and subscribe to our youtube channel it really helps us to grow and spread the incredible message of conservation and uh, we really hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you at the next podcast thanks for listening